Bob Jolly, some of you know me. I'm at the name director. Pleased to see you all here. It's a cold night, so thank you for coming out. Professor Alan Coop graduated from Dartmouth College and then earned his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He teaches courses in history, <coughs> sorry, in the history department of Dartmouth College, primarily on 20th century European history and on the American healthcare system, and we could probably get a good one on that too. He is the author of American Evangelical Missionaries in France, 1945 to 1975, which, quote, narrates the experiences of American evangelical missionaries who came to work in a post-Christian European society, France, rather than a non-Christian culture. He is the author as well of Stark Decency, German Prisoners of War in a New England Village, and some of you may have heard Professor Koop speak here on this book. It is described as an evocative history of World War II German POW camp in New Hampshire, where friendships among prisoners, guards, and villagers overcame the bitter divisions of war. Steve Smith, on his Mountain Wandering blog, says about Professor Koop, Mount Kearsarge, 20, uh, 29,030 feet, is, along with Mount Monadnock and Mount Cardigan, one of the iconic mountains of southern New Hampshire. Its massive bulk dominates the countryside in the bucolic region northwest of Concord. No one knows this mountain better than Alan Coop, who lives 10 minutes away in New London. I hear the train coming. <clears throat> Alan is a history professor at Dartmouth and has been a mountain man going back to his days as a hutman in the lakes in the early 1960s. He gives frequent programs on the history of huts and on the Darby Field ascent of Mount Washington, which, uh, sorry. Um, for years, Alan has been urging me to come down for an insider's tour of Kearsarge, his backyard mountain. By his estimate, he has climbed it over 1,000 times. No, that is not a typo, that is the quote, compared to a mere 200 or so ascents of Mount Washington. Please welcome Professor Alan Coop. I wasn't aware that he was going to mention all the aspects of my peculiar pathology of mountain climbing, but um, somehow that stuck in there. Uh, and it's good to be here. Uh, I'm surprised to see so many people here. I mean, I'm always surprised that anybody shows up for one of these evening historical lectures. Um, and I was trying to figure out, well, I, I sort of did figure out as you sort of came in and I saw all these people it dawned on me probably why many of you are here, because um, I know, and I did some research on this, that um, television networks and advertisers use the February viewing statistics to set their advertising rates, so no one puts any money into January evening television programs. <laughs> so I figured that's the main reason people are here, or there may be another one. I've, I've learned to sort of try to figure out why anybody comes uh, to these talks. I gave this talk on, mm, sometime last fall, a long way from here, in a uh, library in southern New Hampshire, and I was really delighted to see that well over half of those attending, a smaller crowd than this, but well over than half of, uh, of those attending were young people, um, like this group here, uh, but, you know, um, high school students. And I was really delighted, first of all, to see such a uh, strong interest on the part of young people in history and in this age of video games and Facebook in the outdoors. And so after the talk, I went to, to uh, talk to one of them and said, you know, it's really great to see you. How come there's so many of you here? And uh, he said, well, things didn't go too well in history class today. And uh, we were given the choice of detention or coming to your lecture. <laughs> and about half of us uh, came to the lecture. So I have no idea how many of you had trouble today in school. <laughs> so at, um, at any rate, our, the, the topic for me this evening, and I, I always do in, enjoy participating in these um, first Wednesday discussions because um, it, it always attracts a, a knowledgeable crowd. Um, and actually, I'm a little uneasy here because uh, you um, people who live in, in this part of Vermont, I mean, of course, the the best reason to live in this part of Vermont is you get such a great view of New Hampshire. 
Um, especially in the White Mountains, and probably you have better views of the White Mountains than many people in New Hampshire uh, who live close to them. Um, and <coughs> uh, the, uh, this talk sort of got going quite a while ago um, when the Appalachian Mountain Club's White Mountain Hut system was approaching one anniversary or another, I forget what it was, and they approached me to sort of write a history of the White Mountain Hut system. And uh, <coughs> I, well, I, I sort of, read, I think the reason they asked me is I was the only person they knew who was both an historian and a former Hutman. And uh, I never quite got the book written, like a lot of books I haven't quite gotten written. Um, but I have put together this um, talk <coughs> and some pictures, and it, it does fit into my interest in scholarship because as you heard, I teach courses in both European and American history, which is unusual at the college level. They're usually one or the other, and I've been particularly interested in places where European and American history intersect in unusual ways. As you heard, the first book I wrote was the, the work, a study of American evangelical missionaries in post-Christian 20th century France, an unusual coming together of European and American uh, culture. And then my study of the German prisoner of war camp in Stark, New Hampshire, also an unusual coming together of European and American cultures. Um, and this topic, too, more or less fits into that paradigm. Mountain huts are very much a European invention. Uh, but the story we're going to see tonight um, is the way in which this European idea was uh, adopted by Americans, but then had to be adapted to American society and American culture. Um, so what we'll do is I'll, <coughs> I'll have to give a, sort of a visual introduction. I, I confess I give this talk primarily in New Hampshire, primarily to in the parts of New Hampshire where the people are, and they've all sort of sunk to the bottom of the state, uh, you know, and many of them don't know there's really anything north of the hooks it tolls. So, you know, I have to sort of provide them this introduction, but of course, this knowledgeable crowd up here knows something about uh, the White Mountains, and so we're just going to go very quickly through um, a year in, in the history of these very, very special little mountains. Um, now, they're called white, of the White Mountains, because, well, pretty obvious why they were called white, is that's because they are covered with snow for almost six months of the year. And, and although they were sort of in the beginning of American colonial history, um, far into the interior of New England, way away from the settlements on the coast, actually, they were probably one of the first well-known physical features of the American colonies because mariners then, and even today, sailing in the Gulf of Maine on a clear day can easily see these white peaks to the inland. And so there are reports from the 16th century, really, of uh, mariners about the, the White Hills way to the inland. Um, here's an image of the southern peaks of the presidential range from the top of Mount Washington, an image of the Franconia Ridge um, on a nice November day, just its peak sticking above the clouds, um, the kind of winter I would hope we'd had this winter, but it's off to a bad start. Um, and the, the mountains are clad in the snow for many months of the year. The sun does come through, though. Um, the streams begin to melt. The Cascades roar. Life comes to the forest in small forms. The Cascades dwindle by June. And um, in summer months, the white mountains turn the color most people know them, and that is green. Uh, and then there's the particular richness of the ecosystems, um, wood sorrel under the balsams of the upper slopes, a, a bog in the Mahusik Range, and then the special world of the above tree line, the tundra, um, where sedge and rock, uh, and you'll find ice and snow even into the summer months. Um, summer doesn't last long. Here's nature's first Christmas ornament falling onto a balsam fir. Um, the foliage begins high on the peaks and cascades down into the valleys along the streams. A few last glimpses of more somber tones of late autumn a burst of color along the pond, and then the snows come back to the mountains once again, and the white mountains are once again white. 
uh, a year in the life of the White Mountains. But you can see from that man-made object there in the foreground, it was difficult to keep people away from this extremely scenic part of the New Republic. And the White Mountains very quickly became the first, we'd call it today, tourist area in the United States, um, as it wasn't too far from the growing cities on the eastern seaboard. Um, rough roads were hacked through the notches uh, as early as <clears throat> the beginning of the 19th century. Um, the first and now the probably oldest continually used mountain ascending trail, the Crawford Path, was built up Mount Washington uh, in 1819. Um, but then the real surge of interest came with the coming of the railroads through the White Mountains, and that led to the era of the Grand Hotels that were built in the valleys. This is a picture of the first Glen House that was built at the foot of Mount Washington um, in Pinkham Notch. And as you can tell from this early picture, uh, the major problem with the first Glen House was it was just simply too small um, to accommodate the large number of city folk who were taking the train um, to the White Mountains to have a mountain holiday. Um, but the hotels and the, the grand hotels in the valley weren't the only hotels. There were also hotels built on the very summits of the mountains. And I mention this because the, the hut system that I'll be talking about for hikers, they were not the first mountain buildings. Um, the first buildings were um, built on the very summits, like this is the original Mount Washington Summit House, built in 1852. Um, the next year, a, a rival hotel was built just a few feet away, the Tip Top House, until they were, they were finally merged. And people began to go to the tops of these mountains. Now, back then, people wouldn't ever walk anywhere if they could ride. And so relatively soon after the railroads arrived, the major trails were converted to bridle paths. And here's a, a relatively well-known Winslow Homer painting of a woman um, having ridden side saddle on a horse the eight and a half miles up the Crawford bridle path from Crawford Notch to the top of the, the mountains. Here's a, a picture uh, from that era. And you can see behind the uh, well-dressed party and their horses that the stone corral um, that was built um, very close to the summit um, where the horses were kept after the tourists uh, alighted and then walked the last few yards uh, to the summit house themselves. If you, those of you who have hiked Mount Washington on um, the Crawford Path know that the path even today goes through the remnants of the old corral and every time I walked through it, I would say, what a waste of effort. Uh, I'm sure any horse that had been <coughs> pulled up eight and a half miles to the top of Mount Washington wasn't going to go wandering off anywhere, <laughs> and there was probably no need to corral them. Um, but there they were on the top of the mountain. But of course, riding a horse is too much work, and therefore in 1860, the Mount Washington Carriage Road was constructed up the east side of the mountain to bring tourists to the summit in a more commodious way. And then just eight years later, the Mount Washington Cog Railroad was built up the west side. And now it was easy for city folk to come and enjoy the splendors of the mountains. <clears throat> I just love this picture with this um, well-dressed city family um, with their steamer trunks on the platform behind them, having arrived on the summit, perhaps to spend a week or so in what was then a two and a half story summit hotel that um, was complete with an oriental rug on the floor and a string quartet that played um, each evening during the, the uh, evening meal. Mount Washington wasn't the only place that had summit hotels. This is the picture of the summit hotel that was on Mount Lafayette. Um, if you've been up Lafayette recently, you can still see the stone foundations that once supported the Summit Hotel. No one quite knows exactly when it was built nor when it sort of blew away. Um, Mount Musilak also had a Summit Hotel, and like the Grand Hotels in the Valley, it suffered from being too small to meet the trade, and so it was gradually added on to. Um, by this time, people not only were riding up on horses, but uh, this, this new uh, endeavor, well, today would be called hiking. Back then, it was called tramping. And um, people began to even venture away from the horses and the carriages and the railroad to walk up the mountains. Here's an early tramping expedition. They were actually walking up the tracks of the Mount Washington Cog Railroad. 
And these were obviously early pioneers um, in the art of mountain photography, having perfected the photographer's art of tilting the camera to make it look steeper than it really is. Um, something, that, I mean, no train can climb a trestle that steep, obviously. Um, back then, of course, people, unlike today, knew how to dress for mountain climbing expeditions. Bowler hats um, were the accepted headgear. Um, sartorial tendencies are always devolutionary. And so by the end of the 19th century, people had replaced their bowlers with felt crushers or straw hats. But um, hiking or tramping then was, it was difficult. Um, slippery leather soled boots, um, very heavy canvas packs, canned goods, cast iron frying pans, heavy woolen blankets, and when you got where you were going, the, the, probably the most luxurious accommodation was like this bark-covered um, shelter by Hermit Lake in Tuckerman Ravine. Um, maybe there was a better way to do this. It was also dangerous. Um, here is a, a monument to Lizzie Bourne, who was a early victim of the severe weather on Mount Washington. Um, she perished here in a September storm literally a stone's throw from the summit. Um, but neither she nor her father, a, a well-known judge from Maine, who sheltered her in his arms in the storm until she perished, knew how close they were. And the death of Lizzie Bourne created quite a stir. Um, the White Mountains were appealing, but they were very dangerous. Um, maybe there was a better way. And so at one of the great hotels in the valley, the Ravine House, members of the recently founded Appalachian Mountain Club got together to talk it over. The Appalachian Mountain Club, or the AMC, was founded in 1876 by Harvard, MIT professor types for the, the purpose of exploring the White Mountains. Many of them um, had traveled to Europe, and there they had seen in the Tyrolean Alps these little stone huts that the alpinists use <clears throat> to access the higher peaks. And so they talked it over and in 1888 decided that they would build a hut on the presidential range. The place they chose was Mount Madison, um, or really between Mount Madison on the far right and Adams just to its left. Mount Madison, the most northerly of the presidential peaks rising to over 5,000 feet in elevation, 4,000 feet above the broad valley of the Androscoggin River uh, in Berlin. And so there in 1888, the AMC built uh, the first white mountain hut. And uh, the construction of this hut, <clears throat> which begins the story tonight really, was marked by the two things that have always been part of any construction project that I was part of, either as a construction worker when I was a student or um, hiring people today. And of course, you know, those two things are, first of all, cost overrun, and secondly, delay. Um, they, they had to improve the trail uh, so horses could get to within <clears throat> about a mile of the hut. But by the time they got the trail smoothed out, haying season had begun and the horses were all busy during the haying season. And so they couldn't be employed in building the hut until mid-August. And by then, they had to barely get the supplies up there, and the masons worked against the coming fall weather, barely got the place closed in by the time the winter storms arrived in mid-October. Um, and then they submitted the bill to the Appalachian Mountain Club, and the club was not pleased at all. They had budgeted $700. Um, and when the final bill came in at $736, it led to an ex angry exchange of letters between the penny-pinching Boston Brahmins who had signed the deal um, with the fellows from Randolph who had built the hut. Um, it became a very popular place immediately. Um, and the trampers began going there. Um, it was, uh, one problem was that it was, um, well, it was in a very cold location, obviously, above tree line. Um, rains frequently, clouds came in the hut. Fortunately, there was plenty of nearby firewood to keep them warm. There were the shutters on the windows, the floorboards, um, the shingles on the roof. Well, it was sort of very slowly being loved to death. Uh, and so the club decided in 1907, um, quite a long time after it had been built in 1888, to finally assign what they called a hut keeper, um, a young student from Harvard uh, who, it is said, worked with high zeal um, to maintain the hut uh, official AMC documents indicate that, quote, one end of a hut could be curtained off for feminine occupancy. 
And I think that blanket there is the curtain on which the, behind which the feminines were to do their occupying. Um, it was also used as a, <coughs> a winter destination. In fact, the inaugural visit in February of 1889 was in the winter, um, and a snowshoe expedition was led up to the hut, led by Roswell Lawrence, who was the main fundraiser. And I, I read his account of it, and he said, we arrived at the hut in high glee. You know, I'm not sure it's legal to be in high glee anymore, but that was certainly the way <laughs> adventurers in the 19th century described their occasions. Um, here they are crowded into uh, the little hut, and it was so popular that they decided to expand it. And you can see by the two tones in the roof there, they, they built an addition to sort of into the mountainside, um, not realizing that, well, the reason this was called Madison Spring Hut was not just because there was a spring nearby, but that the whole place was a spring. And so it tended to fill up, as it does even today, with ice um, all during the winter. Um, but it was so popular that they needed yet another building. And so <clears throat> in uh, 1908, they began to build Madison Hut Number 2. And so there were two huts. And more people came in winter and in summer. And then in 1912, in the corner of the picture, you see the, a major sort of sociological technological change. That's part of a stove. They brought it up there in pieces and put it together again. And uh, they said, why don't we cook food and we'll sell food to the people who show up? And this really was a major change in the whole ethos of what these were all about. Up until this time, the huts were pretty much just like shelters, except they had four sides and there was someone there watching out for it. People brought their own food, brought their own blankets. Um, but now the hut said, instead of catering to independent trampers, we're going to create a class of dependent trampers. They didn't really articulate it that way, but they said, we will provide blankets, we'll provide fur boughs for the bedding, and we will cook food there. And that became such a, a popular change that usage of the hut rapidly grew, um, so much so they had to build yet another hut in this little tiny mountain valley, Madison Hut Number 3, which was finished in 1922, and today forms the core of the, the rebuilt Madison hut. <clears throat> now the, um, there was one, so that was the story of the origin of Madison. The, the next building the hut built up there wasn't a hut. Um, actually, it was a shelter. Um, the cross there marks the spot where in June of 1900, two prominent members of the Appalachian Mountain Club perished in a, a summer snowstorm. The, um, the, the club that was holding its annual meeting on the summit Everybody but these two men took the train or a carriage to the top, but um, <clears throat> these two men climbed into the storm. One of them perished only 100 yards from the summit. The other one, William Curtis, perished about a mile and a half from the summit. And the, the grief-stricken members of the club decided to build a little refuge shelter uh, on the broad expanse of uh, the upper reaches of Mount Washington. Um, but they made it very clear this was not a hut. Just because you build a building in a mountain doesn't make it a hut. In fact, it was not for pleasure camping. And the official documents and the sign on the door um, said for emergency refuge purposes only. And the capacity of a hut was stipulated um, at six horizontal occupants and 24 vertical occupants, <laughs> some of whom it seems to me had to be very short. Um, <laughs> But this was the, uh, the refuge here that was built on the Crawford Path that endured more or less that way until the mid-1920s. The next place the AMC built a hut, though, was two notches over in the deep defile of Crawford uh, Carter Notch, uh, where there had been a camp of one sort or another ever since the beginning of the 20th century, going through cycles of decay and repair. And there in 1914, the AMC built the second of its two huts, the Carter Notch Hut, uh, with plans almost um, copied uh, exactly from a hut the AMC founders had found in the Tyrolean Alps. Um, it was finished in the summer of 1914. And here's a, a classic photograph of the first hut master at Carter Notch, Red Mac McGregor, um, offering a handshake um, that appeared on many postcards advertising mountain hospitality for all. It was so successful that the next year, <coughs> a third hut was built the place they chose was probably the prime real estate in all of New England at the Lakes of the Clouds, um, the, the two highest bodies of water in the, uh, the Northeast. Um, and they're only a mile and a half from the summit of Mount Washington. 
at 5,000 feet. The Lakes of the Clouds hut was built. Um, it very quickly became the most popular, first because it was so far above tree line, secondly because it was only a mile from the highest peak in the northeast, easily accessible from there. And it was built in a pretty Spartan style. Um, the uh, crude um, structures inside, the, the bunks, um, that as far as I could tell were still there when I worked there a good 50 years later, and we were told and believed that they had um, been rejected by the RB as inadequate for troop carrying ships in the Spanish American War. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if it, as Winston Churchill said, if that wasn't true, it should have been. Um, at, at any rate, uh, here's a, a picture of a, the Lakes of the Clouds hut in an in August snowstorm. And you can see, once again, you can tell from the, the two tone roof there that even after only a few years, its popularity meant that it had to be expanded. Um, so the AMC obviously thought it had a, a good idea going here and it was time to expand it even further. Oh, I, I should have asked, how many of you have been to one of the AMC huts? Oh my goodness, a room full of experts, wouldn't you know? <laughs> how many of you have a hut t-shirt? <laughs> How many of you have an, an Imp Hut t-shirt? Oh, you haven't been there, huh? Well, that was the next hut, Imp Hut. Um, in 1916, the AMC rented from the American Realty Corporation this log shelter on Imp Mountain in the Carter Mariah Range, just to the east of the Presidentials, to continue this idea of expanding the hut system. The only problem was well, nobody really wanted to go there, or at least all summer, only 28 people showed up, um, and the hut keeper went a good two weeks once without seeing another soul. So when the American Realty Corporation tried to jack the rent from five bucks a year to 25 bucks a year, the AMC backed out of the deal and said, we're not gonna do that anymore. And they also shelved their plans to build a hut on Mount Webster near Crawford Notch. Instead, they went back to the valley. They said, we, we need some sort of <clears throat> roadside facility to operate as a headquarters. And so they chose Pinkham Notch right at the base of the east face of Mount Washington with its great ravines. And there in uh, 1920, the AMC built Pinkham Notch Camp, which served as a hut, but also as the headquarters. It, um, it operated as the huts. There were um, bunk, bunk houses, there were, here's the, the wash house that offered cold and cold running water. And um, uh, except for being on the road, it was pretty much operated as a hut. Um, well, speaking of being on the road, this proved to be a major change for the huts now in the <clears throat> 1920s. And they were shaped by, by two major historical movements that swept through northern New England. Um, one was, of course, roads and the automobiles. Now, uh, this part of the world wasn't open just to the upper industrial classes who had the money for a month away with steamer trunks brought up by railroads. They were easily accessible by uh, several hours of drive from Boston. Um, and this was, of course, the time that motels and cabins grew up. And so ordinary families, ordinary people with their newfangled motor cars came. Also, the summer camp movement took over in New Hampshire and in Vermont. And this was a great destination for all these campers. <clears throat> and it raised a real issue. Um, should the huts be sort of um, organized to maximize utilization by signing up one camp group after another all through the summer to make sure they're always occupied and produce a revenue stream? Or should they be more or less open to ordinary families, individuals, on a first come, first serve basis. And this produced a real debate in the 1920s, again in the 1970s, and is part of the experience even today. Um, although the most important arrival were not all the camp girls who came in the 20s, <coughs> but maybe one individual, uh, Joe Dodge, um, who came to Pinkham Notch in 1922, and then four years later, as he said, threw away the key and kept Pinkham Notch open all year long. And Joe Dodge became uh, a, a legend really in his own time. Here he is f f um, third from the right as the leader of the Pink and Notch crew. He was one of the founding members of the Mount Washington Weather Observatory that would, um, was con uh, founded in 1932 and would continue until the present day um, with weather observations on the highest point <coughs> in uh, New England. Um, he was a pioneer in 
avalanche rescue techniques in Tuckerman Ravine. Um, Joe was a, a builder, uh, a barber, um, above all, a bon vivant. Um, and in 1953, along with Robert Frost, an honorary degree recipient um, from Dartmouth College, who on his official um, diploma put um, to Joe Dodge from Dartmouth College from one New Hampshire institution uh, to another. Um, for many decades, Pinkham Notch was known by most people simply as Doge, Joe Dodge's place. Um, the impact of population in the 20s meant once again <clears throat> um, expanding the hut system. And here's a, a wonderful picture of the um, Boston Hut Committee in their properly uh, tweed uh, coated uh, <coughs> outfits deciding how their money was going to be spent, adding a new addition onto the most popular hut, um, that of Lakes of the Clouds. You see it there, they made a T on the hut and uh, the window room there was the, the ladies' bunk room, right? They needed a large bunk room because of all the women who were showing up there. And uh, they also decided, because it's such a damp location, we need to build it with much larger windows so that you know, it can dry out, not realizing that the larger windows simply let more clouds in, making it even damper. Also, they didn't realize that having built this, <clears throat> the only place that <clears throat> noontime picnickers could get out of the prevailing northwest winds was on the grass right in front of that enormous window that looked into the women's bunk room, um, <laughs> giving it its unofficial name of the goldfish bowl. Um, here's a picture of a Lakes of the Clouds Hutman packing blankets um, into the hut on the first day of the season. You can see snow still there. There's a rumor, it was never proven, of course, that the blankets were clean during the off season. Uh, here's a, uh, another uh, picture of a crew of, of Hutman packing supplies to the hut. Um, supplies are packed, as you can imagine, uphill from the valley to most of the huts, except to Lakes of the Clouds on Mount Washington. Um, they were taken up to the summit, first by railroad and then by truck, and then packed downhill from the top to the hut. Here's another 1920s photograph of the annual Lakes of the Clouds ice flow competition. Um, and, and then what happened was, by the end of that decade, another expansion came along. Um, and the state of New Hampshire really gave the AMC a push at Lonesome Lake. There, the state inherited a, a former fishing camp um, that at one time had been sort of reserved for the elite. Um, but now it was somehow ended up in the state. The state didn't know what to do with it. They said to the AMC, do you want to run this? as a hut. The AMC wasn't sure they wanted to do that so far away from its other operations on the eastern side of the mountains. They said, well, we'll give it a year in 1929. It proved so popular that they said, okay, let's just, <clears throat> let's build more huts. And so um, across Franconia Notch in 1930, they began to construct Greenleaf Hut um, on the short, sh <coughs> excuse me, shoulder of Mount Lafayette. Um, and then they decided to build two more huts in the 20 miles between the two notches. Um, Zeeland Falls Hut, built in 1931, and also uh, the most remote hut, um, Galehead Hut, built um, near South Twin Mountain in 1931 as well. And this, of course, is an unusual decision anyway. Not, there weren't too many businesses in America that greatly expanded their capital operations in 1931. Um, but in the, even in the Great Depression, the AMC realized or guessed that hiking was a recreation of the future and there was a real market for these huts. And um, after having built Galehead, it was built um, by logs cut right there on the site and twitched there by horses. Um, it was then six and a half miles from the road, <coughs> perched on the edge of the Pemigewasset Wilderness, um, the most remote of the huts and always a very special place. And this completed what I referred to already was the, the AMC hut system. And this is what made it unique, um, no other bunch of huts, mountain buildings in the world operate like this because it was <clears throat> now possible to hike from one end of the White Mountains in Lonesome Lake and Franconia Notch all the way to Carter Notch, um, very close to Maine, um, each of these huts being spaced a day's hike apart and hikers or trampers need carry only their clothing. They found in the huts um, a, a be bunk bed, blankets, and were provided with a breakfast, a uh, supper, and a trail lunch. <clears throat> and so this is what made the hut system really take off. But if you sort of frame it in the, the larger way of American doing things, it fit, fit very closely and early with the American idea 
of franchise accommodations. Um, uh, Americans sort of like to know what they're getting into. And of course, and of course, the person who really capitalized on this, literally, at the exact same time in the 1930s was Howard Johnson. And he realized the Americans, if you see one orange roof restaurant, all, you know what you're going to get into. And the Huff system really was, although it seemed to be quirky and independent, it really was one of the first sort of franchises in American history. It was so successful that the AMC said, <clears throat> well, let's now move into this new sport of skiing. And they thought that Pinkham Notch would be the center of the then burgeoning ski development, um, coming mostly from colleges in, in New Hampshire and Vermont. The AMC was sure that the, the, these little blips on the radar, they wouldn't have called it that then, of course, these little new innovations called upski facilities, like Cranmore or Cannon Mountain or Stowe, these were just going to disappear, that real skiers would always prefer to ski up the mountain and then ski down. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't have a Midas touch with their business decisions, and so they found out pretty much that wasn't the way skiing was gonna go, and so their hopes for Pinkham Notch being the center of the ski up, ski down business pretty much evaporated. They went back to doing what they did best, and that is running the huts in the summer. And so in 1938, the hut system celebrated uh, its 50th anniversary, and here's a, a collection of current and former hut people on the roof of Madison Spring Hut, celebrating what was really a 50th anniversary of this remarkably new and enduring um, American institution. <clears throat> but then just a few weeks after um, this happened, um, the, the first of two events that really shook the Huss system occurred. Um, the first was in September when the, um, probably the, still the most devastating storm ever to hit New England, the Hurricane of 38, um, roared through, rendering three of the huts completely inaccessible um, the next summer because the trails had been so devastated. Um, but then just two years later following that, um, Joe Dodge got a phone call one October night that he always feared from the proprietor at the Ravine House in Randolph who called up and said, Joe, there's a, a strange orange glow on the skyline. Uh, and sure enough, Madison Hunt had caught fire um, and burned to the ground. Um, the, the, um, there was no damage to anybody there. They, the guests got out with their belongings, but everything else that could, be, but could burn did burn. <clears throat> the only silver lining is that there wasn't a convenient um, fire hydrant, and so there was no cold water poured onto hot masonry um, which meant they really could use the masonry walls for rebuilding it. <clears throat> Joe said going up the next day was like going to a funeral. It was too early in October to rebuild it, and so they started first thing next year rebuilding Madison, carrying the timbers up the valley way. It's pretty hard to walk up a mountain trail um, with those kind of boards on your back. Joe tried to find many different ways of doing it. He <coughs> broke, uh, entered the football lockers at Gorham High School and got the shoulder pads and thinking maybe you could put shoulder pads on two Hutmen and carry the boards between them. That didn't work, so that led to the creation of a, a new little White Mountain business called the White Mountain Jackass Corporation. Um, and um, donkeys were used to carry supplies to Madison Hut and they would be used to provision the huts well into the 1960s, leading of course to a long-standing competition. Um, who could pack more weight? A uh, hutman or a donkey? <laughs> Who was smarter, a hutman or a donkey? And no one's been able to figure that one out. Um, but by any rate, by the uh, summer, August of 1941, Madison Hut had been completely rebuilt, um, bigger and, and better than ever. But of course, just a few months after that, uh, a far greater tragedy than one hut burning um, swept <coughs> the American people with the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the entry of America into the Second World War. Um, the war, of course, probably the worst thing that ever happened, changed everything in America, and it even changed the hut system. Ironically, of all the places you could be in the world that in those years, the hut system was probably the best. Um, but the hut system could endure uh, only by changing. Only those, <coughs> only those huts whose trailheads could be reached by railroad were able to remain open during the war because of gasoline rationing. Also, they were running out not only of gasoline, but of of workers, because as young men were drafted, um, the huts had to make the critical and hitherto un, 
impossible decision to employ women working in the huts. And um, women, um, halves of married couples, ran two of the huts during the war. And there was even a woman hut master working alongside uh, Joe Dodge at Pinkham Notch. And, Notch and I, I read her letter her re as she reported in uh, her first year there. She said, uh, <clears throat> in a way that was very typical of the attitude, um, no doubt that fellows should run the huts in normal times. But now Joe needs us, and we've got to show him that women aren't entirely useless. Um, the war ended, and the women left. And of course, that was pretty much the standard operation. Women were to work in male-dominated industries, but just for the duration. The war ended, the men came back, and immediately the huts became, once again, extremely popular. Um, they, they had a great upsurge in use, and it was a good deal. For four bucks, you got supper, lodging, breakfast, and a trail lunch. And um, there were so many people pressing on the huts, they decided once again, well, let's expand. And so they expanded to the east with Evans Notch Hut. Anyone stayed at Evans Notch Hut? <clears throat> you would have confessed to um, being superannuated by doing that. But anyway, it was uh, actually, it was a, a building already in existence. It's 100 yards into Maine in Evans Notch and um, on Route 113, but the hut operated it as another hut for about four or five years in the 1950s uh, until finally, like Imp Hut, it just seemed to be too out of the way for most trampers. But the, the mountains filled up once again with camp girls. Also, Pinkham Notch now did become the center, not only of skiing, but also of the relatively new sport of winter mountain climbing with uh, surplus gear from the 10th Mountain Division and by the thousands. Um, skiers began to discover Tuckerman Ravine and other slopes of Mount Washington. Tourists began to come to the mountains in great droves, riding the Cog Railroad to the increasingly cluttered summit of Mount Washington, but they didn't go to the huts. Of course, the biggest event in American history at this time was the birth of the baby boomers. And um, the baby boomers were toddlers. They didn't hike. Their parents were busy, busy chasing them around tourist resorts. And so in spite of a series of provocative brochures, um, by the end of the 1950s, the hut system was one or two steps ahead of bankruptcy. And then it all turned around in one year, and the fellow responsible for it is there in the hat in the foreground, Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, who wrote an article on the hut system that was appeared the next year in the National Geographic, uh, leading to um, an almost 50% increased in hut usage in one year. Now this probably would have happened anyway because it was the beginning of the 1960s, this explosion of outdoor recreation as the baby boomers were now teenagers and were buying things like backpacks and hiking boots. Um, but again, the pressure of population meant that Lonesome Lake Hut, which was literally falling into the lake, um, had to be rebuilt by the state of New Hampshire, who owns Lonesome Lake, on the other side of the lake. Uh, the lake. Mispa Springs Shelter was replaced in 1965 um, by yet another hut on the side of Mount Clinton. <clears throat> and Lakes of the Clouds Hut, the most popular, was given a, a new large dining room. Um, the trading post at Pinkham Notch was the old one taken down, the new one built. Um, now, of course, construction had been part of the hut system from the beginning, and you've seen other pictures of hutmen carrying in um, wooden um, boards to rebuild the hut. But the new construction at Lakes of the Clouds and Mispa was steel girders, and they couldn't find a hutman or a donkey dumb enough to try that. And so that led to a major technological change. Uh, another barrier that people had said back in the old days would never be crossed, and that was using helicopters um, to provision the huts. At first, they were used just for construction, but later they were used to supply the huts with heavy material um, at the beginning of the season, halfway through the season, and also to evacuate waste. Um, a major technological change that changed the character of the experience and uh, the number of people who were able to work at the hut. Um, a long way, of course, from the old days when um, there were no helicopters, men were men, um, limmer boots had brass hooks, and um, professors were boys. Uh, but with a very, very quickly from this, this time of sort of a, a general enthusiasm of building more and more huts, um, suddenly, there came major changes to American society and to the hut system. 
One change was really a retrograde, going back to the old way of, of keeping the huts open in winter. Two huts, Carter Notch and Zealand, were kept open um, in the winter time. But as the 60s went into the 70s, um, what happened was a, a general sort of feeling that, oh, there are so many people coming, we need more huts, led to a decision, maybe we don't need to build more huts, and plans to build a hut at Sphinx Call and Mount Jefferson were um, next. And also, there were widespread demands that the hut system be actually dismantled. Um, and the reason was the beginning of the conflict in American society in the 1970s <clears throat> over just about everything, but particularly about the impact on the environment. Um, I mentioned before that the AMC established itself as a conservation hyphen recreation organization. Um, <clears throat> as I tell my students, um, hyphenated entities are inherently unstable, like say, <laughs> Austria-Hungary, you know? Um, and of course, there's an inevitable conflict between recreation and conservation. As this aerial image shows, even trails have an environmental impact. And a real debate broke out in the 1970s, continued forward, about the environmental impact of the huts. Um, and here you can see a hut paths. Um, now, I should say, as environmental impacts go, <clears throat> this is not you know, the Exxon Valdez or the Amazon rainforest or the Gulf oil spill. Um, this is pretty much small potatoes compared to them. Uh, and it's not really a scientific environmental issue. A scientific environmental issue can be resolved statistically. This is an aesthetic environmental issue. And of course, aesthetic debates in a pluralistic society have a way of going on forever. Um, the opponents of the huts didn't want any structures built in the mountains and said, we ought to take them down. Um, whereas the hut supporters said the stone and shingled historic buildings blended in much better than did the bright red neon um, tents of the campers. And so there was a real sort of cultural clash between the campers and the hut people, environmentalists and the traditionalists. The real issue though was, um, was waste. Um, back in the old days, it seemed so simple. You brought a garbage pan, pail down to the hut, and then you took a young huntman and gave him a six pack of beer and a shovel <clears throat> and sent him out to the delicate alpine tundra and um, said, dig a big hole and we'll throw all the stuff in there. Um, even as an absolutely, and I participated unwittingly in this kind of desecration, but as a sort of clueless 16 year old up at Lakes of the Clouds, I looked around and realized this, this can't go on forever. There's not enough mountain to make a big um, garbage pit or as it was called a gaboon there. And so what happened was the Appalachian Mountain Club dug up all the old garbage pits going way back to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, guys there with hazmat suits and helicopters and then um, carefully replaced them with soil and seeded them over in that lovely sort of grassy area out there now which, which many picnickers use on a calm day for their lunch not knowing at all that they're sitting on the side of the former garbage dump um, of the hut. <clears throat> and um, the huts have employed rather elaborate septic systems and now water-free toilets. And of course, there's a great irony, and that is that the elaborate septic systems they have now, um, although less um, polluting of the actual mountainside, you know, are far more visually polluting than the old days when effluent simply oozed out of a rusty iron pipe onto the mountainside. Um, the the uh, huts also view themselves as places for environmental education. And um, the, the crews and the naturalists assigned to each hut view a captive audience coming through every night and they use the time to educate people on proper stewardship of the mountain, leave no trace ethics um, to minimize the impact of the huts. But of course, um, the, uh, the White Mountain so-called wilderness is kind of artificial. Um, it's small. Actually, the White Mountains are probably the only place in America um, that are wilder now than they were 150 or 200 years ago. Um, when timber barons slashed all the cuttable timber in the mountains, when <laughs> private individuals had their own little cabins on the slopes of Mount Adams, <clears throat> when the Boston and Mail Railroad, Main Railroad envisioned an electric trolley car circling Mount Washington three times before ending up at a four-story stone castle on the top. They ran out of money before it got off the ground. And when federal road planners had all the plans drawn up for a 
sort of a um, <clears throat> uh, skyline drive across the presidential range. Um, instead, there's been sort of a retrogression to a, a more natural feature, and the, the mountains are wilder now than they used to be, but it's an artificially, to some extent, constructed wilderness. The, the most remote place um, in the White Mountains is no more than probably six and a half miles from a paved road, and if you're desperate, no more than 13 miles from a McDonald's. <clears throat> um, the 1970s also brought a sudden discovery um, of the huts by the state of New Hampshire, um, who realized that these places are doing things like serving food, so maybe there ought to be some rules um, enforced. Like, And so many of the traditions, such as um, <clears throat> inviting camp girls to help stir the scrambled eggs in the morning, um, taking a bath in the kitchen sink on a cloudy day, um, all these things were sort of outlawed. Um, there were no longer any sort of inviting the guests into the kitchen to help prepare the meal or dry the dishes. Um, and also the huts decided to sort of manifest a more austere face. Um, the number of bunks above tree line was reduced to limit the impact of the people. Um, the elaborate gourmet meals were um, <clears throat> replaced by one pot meals. Uh, and this is all during the 1970s. You, you notice how no one ever says, ah, the 70s. Um, <laughs> you're probably keeping very tucked away uh, out of sight pictures of you in the 70s, afraid your grandkids might find them and blackmail you for the polyester suits, the long sideburns, and all the other nonsense. Um, one thing that did happen in the 70s that won gradual and then rapid approval was women working in the huts. Um, actually, women had worked in the huts from the very beginning. They just got paid for it in the 1970s. From the very beginning, the girlfriends of the Hutman went up there and worked alongside them, and they cooked, and they cleaned, and sometimes they even carried a pack. Actually, way back in the 20s, um, there had been <clears throat> uh, a, a small effort to maybe have women work on the huts because there were an increasing number of complaints from the clientele about the slovenly character of the huts. And it was thought that a woman's touch you know, might fix that up. But I, I examined the documents of the AMC, and they debated this issue for less than 20 minutes um, and just decided women can't pack. Um, but um, in the 1960s, women began to work at Pinkham Notch. And then in the 1970s, um, women began working in the huts. A major change eased along by a, a court injunction, of course, um, but, but very rapidly, um, the hut system went from being a male bastion to one that really welcomed women. By 1979, the first all-women's crew had taken a lonesome lake hut, and um, by 1982, a woman, um, Barbara Wagner, um, sat in Joe Dodge's chair as the head of the hut system. And in, in recent years, <clears throat> the hut system has tended, I think, to employ just slightly more women than men. Um, so it, it had gone from a place where women were most unwelcome to a place that has um, parity or even uh, feminine dominance. I will, I just sort of put one word in for the cause of gender equality, um, and that is when, when I visited the, the co-ed crew rooms in which my two daughters worked in the huts, um, my response was exactly the same as my mother's when she had visited an all-male crew room that I worked in. How can people live in such squalor? But, um, <laughs> Uh, the, as the, uh, the, uh, by the end of the 20th century, the huts sort of had moved past the, the bitterness of the 1970s, but the population pressure was still there. These, these eight little huts are within a day's drive of about 90 million people. Um, so far, they haven't all decided to show up on the same August weekend. Um, but the, the issues of the huts and cost are still very prominent. Um, the huts had to be rebuilt, Gale Head Hut, was rebuilt at the, <clears throat> in the 1990s. And then the hut system sort of ran afoul of the authorities. And a major debate broke out over the hut system um, in the 1990s because with the exception of Madison Hut, which was owned by the hut on its own land, and Lonesome Lake Hut, which is owned by the state of New Hampshire, all the other huts were operated by a special use permit on federal land, the White Mountain National Forest, um, and which was issued every 30 years. The first one um, was issued to Joe Dodge when he went into the forest supervisor and said, sign here. And then he took the paper out, and that was all there was to it. In the 60s, it took maybe a day. 
Um, but by the 1990s, of course, American society had changed, <clears throat> and the Appalachian Mountain Club had ruffled a lot of feathers, primarily with its environmental issues on dams, on rivers in Maine. And, and that led to uh, a concerted effort by some to employ all the legal weapons they had um, to challenge the Appalachian Mountain Club's right to have a special use permit to run the hut system uh, in the White Mountain National Forest. And of course, that led to, as you can imagine, a, a mandatory series of hearings and reports and all that. And what it did really was it sort of, as there are many hearings in cities uh, all through New Hampshire, um, it brought out of the woodwork an enormous reservoir of popular support for the hut system. And, and the attempt to sort of use the law to maybe shut it down or tweak the AMC more or less backfired and the huts were sort of given the new permit with some um, stipulations primarily about um, uh, environmental impact um, as Gale Head was rebuilt, but also the oldest hut system, which had been rebuilt several times, Madison Hut, had to be rebuilt at the beginning of this century and it was finished a couple of years ago as the hut system faced finished into a sort of a new century uh, and the new millennium, still dealing with these larger issues. Um, and they're issues that, that are behind every institution like education or healthcare or hospitality, cost, value, and access. What Americans want in all of our institutions, we want highest possible quality, lowest possible cost, and immediate access. And you can always get two of them, um, but you can never get three of them. And um, the HUT system, went from being uh, sort of a, a real deal to being relatively expensive. It, uh, a night at the hut, you have to book them way in advance. It'll chew up the better part of a $95 bill. Um, but of course, the, the people who work there <coughs> don't get paid the, what we thought was a whopping salary of 16 bucks a week um, back in the old days. Um, but the experience of the hut system also reflects American history. These huts reflect you know, that a very small slice of the world's history that has enough money to have recreation. The industrial middle class of the eastern seaboards founded this club and built these little huts because they wanted to get away and hike in the mountains. Something that no one has to do to keep alive, but of course now those of us who live here in northern New England know what it's like to live in a place where we live in a consumer economy that's primarily based upon recreation. When you think about it deeply, you know, that's a pretty sketchy place to live because nobody needs most of the things that most of us do. Um, but it's very much a part of American life. Um, it reflects all, each of the decades the hut system took off because of automobiles and the summer camp movement. Even the Great Depression explained the expansion. It was, they expanded their capital investment, but mainly it was investment in labor. And the one thing you could get really cheaply in the Depression was laborers. And so they built those new huts by employing people for pennies a day, really. And then, of course, we've seen the impact of the baby boomers. Um, and now it's still the main impact. Um, the, uh, now the baby boomers are graying. Um, if you hike in the White Mountains, I mean, I don't see anyone here who looks old enough to be a baby boomer, but you might encounter some of these aging baby boomers who really probably are the most active cohort of a hiking population. You go in the mountains any time but a, a Saturday in August, you're far more likely to encounter um, an experienced 65 or 70 year old than you are sort of a clueless 18 year old hiking. Um, and now the, the people who work on the huts really are not the most experienced people uh, in the mountains anymore. So we've, it's reflected the larger American history. But there's also a timelessness about the huts that you know if you've been there. Um, the <clears throat> getting up in the morning and getting on the trail checking the guidebook, wondering how things could have gone wrong so quickly. Um, little people you meet on the trail, if you start them that young, they go on to be hut masters uh, later on. Um, critters that populate the mountains. Your first glimpse of a hut at the end of the trail, you maybe have a moment of quiet reflection in an empty hut in the afternoon. You may have met the crew, they have the best summer job in America and they're thankful for it, they work hard. Also play hard, tundra golf is far more challenging than it seems. <clears throat> a member of the Lakes of the Clouds 1927 string quartet, um, a bath in the sink before the state health inspectors knew about those things. <clears throat> the um, Fourth of July parade in Gorham with empty boxes, 
Um, but then no matter what the hijinks in the valley, the always getting back to the hut in time for the, the catalyst of the hut experience, the evening meal, fresh baked bread, uh, flurry of activity in the kitchen, fancy foods for fam fancy occasions, but usually like this meal in Carter Notch Hut, the oldest building currently in use, um, good food, plenty of it, um, interesting conversation, um, and a uh, talk by a crew member. Um, <coughs> The, the slice of the population that uses the huts a little narrower than it once was, but um, it, you, you do get people together there that you don't get in other walks, uh, in other places. Um, my first night staying in the hut, I was, I think, 15, 14, and um, my table mates there uh, were um, a, a dairy farmer from just here outside of St. Johnsbury, a truck driver from Berlin, a theologian from Harvard, and a physicist from MIT. And even as a clueless teenager, I realized there's probably no place else in America where you can get these people sitting around the dinner table. After dinner, there's always the sunset. Um, if you are kept awake by people snoring next to you, um, the benefit is you're awake for the sunrise. Might as well get up and catch it. The first rays of light on the summits, uh, breakfast, and then on the trail again. Um, the huts are heavily subsidized. I shouldn't say that. They're subsidized by the work of the crews who work there very long hours and hard work for relatively small wages. And they're also subsidized by the, the goodwill of those who stay there who pay um, a good chunk of change for relatively inconvenient accommodations. But they, they do it simply for the larger experience. Um, and the huts really are, are not just buildings. Um, they're more or less, um, a, they're more of a society than they are structures. If you go there in the winter, they have a certain drama, but they, they don't have an appeal um, because they, they lack their people. And so the real story of the hut system is, is not the story of these stone and shingle buildings that are built on the ridge pole of the White Mountains. Uh, it's not the story of um, solar systems or septic systems or how to provision them. The, the, the story of this unique mountain society that is recreated in a sort of Brigadoon-like fashion. Uh, every night of the summer, across the White Mountains. Um, it's a society that is created um, by those who stay there um, and also created uh, by those who work there, who see these little buildings not just as a place to stay or a place to work, but a kind of, of culture that perpetuates itself um, year after year. Um, people go back to the huts on a certain weekend in the summer, <clears throat> often expecting to find <coughs> some of the same people who were there a year ago, and they do, vacation patterns being the same. Um, and it, all, it has this unique feeling of welcoming, uh, a, a warmth of a light on a, the end of a dark autumn day. Um, you start some people hiking very early, like that little person on the table there. Um, the special solitude of a, a mountain sunset, um, a moonrise over Mount Lafayette, and the, the special world of the Appalachian Mountain Club Believe it's a hut society, and there are two sort of ways I'll conclude that. The, there is a, a group of people known as the OH, or Old Hutman's Association. Um, and these are, it's, it's an association, very active, um, comprised of those who have worked in the hut system, um, those who worked there last summer, from those who worked there <clears throat> who are now in their 90s. Um, and they, they stay in touch, um, they have reunions, they have functions. As far as I know, the folks who work in the summer at Super 8, you know, don't have these kinds of uh, reunions. Um, I'm in touch with the, uh, the, the fellows um, that I worked with last summer at Lakes of the Clouds, a group of us who worked in the hut um, 50 years ago, took over the hut for a night while the, the crew was off on a, at a, their annual summer party, and we ran the hut just as we had um, 50 years ago. But it's not just those who work there, it's those who stay there. Um, I was giving this talk <coughs> uh, in southern New Hampshire last year, and I was waiting out, outside the building at the back door, and uh, a woman drove in very slowly, emerged with great uh, difficulty from her car, grabbed a hold of her walker, and began to proceed toward the, the ramp where I was standing. She didn't know that I was the speaker, um, and as she got up to me, she just sort of raised herself to all of her five foot two inches and just said so proudly, I stayed in one of those huts 70 years ago. And she was very much a part of this unique mountain society that's the White Mountain Hut System. Thank you. <clears throat>
if anyone has a question, there's probably someone here who can answer it. Yeah. Like this, is it uh, warm inside the house? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no, the, the two huts that run um, in the winter are not heated. Um, there's a cook stove, maybe for the crew, but no, you're expected to bring um, very warm sleeping bags. I wouldn't go tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, probably, um, it probably hasn't changed much over the last 10 years, because as far as I know, from June to September, the huts pretty much run at capacity. You know, most of them are filled most of the time, probably between 30 and 34,000 overnights, 200,000 day visitors stop in and use the toilets, you know, buy hot chocolate, something like that, which really, in, in a way, their greatest contact with the population is not for overnight guests, but day visitors, which is never envisioned when they were first built. Yeah. Well, I, I, enough to dodge the question, but yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, they're, they're both venerable institutions. The difference, of course, is the, the Randolph Mountain Club has a, a series of, although they're closed cabins, they're run like shelters with a, you know, a caretaker. Um, they don't provide food, which of course is the critical thing I said early on. The AMC has created this class of dependent hikers. You know, if they didn't feed them, they'd be lost. Whereas the people who go to Crag Camp or Greenob, they don't need the caretaker there. In fact, they probably wish he wasn't there or she wasn't there. Yeah. Well, um, not huts per se. Moose Life is owned by Dartmouth College and there's you know, there's a ravine lodge at the bottom, but there used to be a summit hotel in Moose Lodge, and there used to be cabins all around Moose Lodge, but there's nothing on the summit now. Primarily for uh, environmental reasons. Yeah. Did you say anything about the history of uh, uh, the tradition of the blanket folding demonstration? Oh. <laughs> Morning theatrical tip soliciting stuff? No. <laughs> Do you want me to say something about it? Yeah. Well, those of you who have been there, do you all know what he's talking about? The blanket? Actually, you know, of all the people in this world, I can speak with the longest authority on that because as far as I know, I'm the inventor of the blanket <laughs> folding demonstration. It's a great, actually, it's a great story of thespian history because when I invented it, I walked before, I mean, we had, the, the hut was full of people, mostly camp girls who rolled their blankets up in a ball, and I said, we've got to do something. So I went out there with this old blanket and did a 20-second demonstration and maybe said one thing that was funny. And it just sort of evolved into this thing that often rivals Broadway plays. I mean, there, there are about 10 of these skits that newcomers to the huts are required sort of to memorize. There's a trunk full of all the, of the, um, the costumes and all that. So it's, it's become part of the hut tradition, but it was invented by the main reason I do most things, and that's the motivation was sloth. <laughs> I got tired of folding blankets. <laughs> yeah. There's a challenge for the, some of the crew members to go between huts, racing between the huts. When did that start? Uh, what is the path? That's, well, yeah, I mean, there, there are several, I mean, there, over the years, there's been this idea that you can, you know, those in shape can traverse the entire hub system in 24 hours. Um, people still do that. Um, I never did because I tried several times, but at the, I, whatever hub I got to first, I had friends there and I chatted. <laughs> and so, it, it's a, it's still part of it. Yeah, there are all kinds of records and stuff like that, athleticism, but um, it's, a, it's a relatively minor part of the experience. Relatively few people who work on the huts try to do that. Yeah? In any collection of memorabilia, we have one of those pack frames 
from his experience. Mm -hmm. Does anybody care to have it? <laughs> um, well, uh, I was always told I couldn't take my pack frame because it belonged to the AMC. Um, so <laughs> okay, no, nope, I mean, I, yeah, you know what? The, you know, there's that new, um, you know, White Mountain Museum in Plymouth. You know, sooner or later, they're gonna put it on a display of the huts. So that'd be a good place to take it. Yeah. Yes, of course, it's crazy. Yep. I, I agree, but there's so much good, good chatting to be done along the way. So. Well, thanks very much. I enjoyed being here.